Okay, well, I'm I'm here uh, today with uh, Les Bushney. Um, it's very very hot here in the Philippines and humid, so please forgive me if I if I look a bit sweaty. But uh, I have put on my aircon, uh, but it doesn't seem to be do- making much of a dent. Um, uh, I knew Les's brother George Bushney when I was a teenager. We were both in the same uh, church youth group, um, but I- I've never met Les before until today. Uh, and Les was mm-hmm. was in the Grey Scouts, and it's my great uh, privilege to and pleasure to have you here today, Les. Welcome. Thank you. Thank and, you, John. And let's have your story. Tell us about you know where you grew up and where you went to school and how you ended up in the Grey Scouts. I will do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we come from a history of um, pioneer stock into Rhodesia. Um, my my great grandfather came over with Cecil Rhodes, and he was the only ferrier that came through um, doing all the horses, sure. uh, shoes and that. And they crossed over the Tuli block and fought all the rebellions up in, I think it was 19, I mean, 1893, somewhere in that era. And um, yeah, and so anyway, that's, and he was married to uh, his wife. She was a Mart von Rohan. And, uh, and they had, I think they had about seven kids that came with them on the trek, uh, varying from baby to to my grandfather, who was 14 years old. And um, yeah, so they crossed the Judy block. And then because of the great deeds crossing with roads, um, at the end, they were given a farm each and a street named uh, after them in Salisbury. And so if you're going to Hillside, uh, the suburb in, I think it's Hillside in, in Salisbury, you'll see Bushney Street. Gosh. And uh, we're quite proud of that. <laughs> 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 and uh yeah, and then um, and then he had a farm given to him in in uh, Fort Victoria, and uh, he named it Chukori. It was just a piece of land, and he built it up. And it's funny, um, uh, John, that uh, I was reading in the, uh, reading somewhere, and uh, these two ministers, now that it's Zimbabwe, were fighting over Chukori farm because the one took over and was doing nothing with it, and the other one wanted to boot him off so he could do something. And yeah, the name Chakori still stands. <laughs> yeah. And then um, then his, uh, my grandfather, or my opa, he, he had a farm also in, in uh, Fort Vic, and his farm was called Mistyvale. And he had three and a half thousand acres, and then my dad took over, and um, yeah, so the farming carried on. Um, and now I'm farming. <laughs> so the, it's, it's carried on over the years. Um, yeah, and that was uh, where we come from. Um, I went to Hamilton High School uh, with George and Alistair, my twin brother, and uh, we only reached um, Standard 7, um, so uh, then we were expelled, Alistair and I, um, being mamparas, <laughs> but we got our JPSS just past Standard 7. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so from school, um, we started an appy ship, and Alistair got a job straight away at Dunlop uh, Rhodesia in Bulawa. And I managed to find a job at Fisher Motors in next door to Fritz Roadhouse in Bulawayo. And I did automotive machining, crankshaft grinding, reboring, uh, cylinder repairs, and all that. Um, then I went to college. And again, I caused mischief at college. And they wanted to, they sent me to court twice, to apprentice court. And I sat in there and, um, and they said, in the second time, they, sus- they suspended me again. And they said, the best place for you is to go and join the RLI. <laughs> and they wanted to cancel my AP ship, but they didn't somehow. And um, my dad's mate, uh, Bert Comley, he was the AP officer for Dunlop because it was a huge organization. And he said to my dad, get him to change his, his uh, trade from automotive machining to fit and turner, <clears throat> which is what I did. And he, he got me through. But uh, no sooner were we in our happy ship, and uh, that's when we got called up for the army. What happened next is uh, I was at work, and this brown letter came in the post, and it said, uh, on Her Majesty's service, uh, you've been called up for uh, intake 139A company. That was in the beginning of 1974. Yeah, so anyway, off we went, and I was so excited because uh, I really wanted to go to, to the army. And when I arrived at the William Barracks, I thought I'd arrived in hell. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. And uh, yeah, they gave us a good rev there. And anyway, went through first phase, second phase, and what. And they chose me to be a rear anchor. 
So I ended up going to Gwala to become a rear anchor and uh, went through that whole blooming rubbish of um, learning how to break people's spirits down and uh, get get the name of discipline up. Hey, and it wasn't me. I just wanted to be with my mates. And they'd all moved to Nyanga, the independent. And anyway, I asked for a, um, a transfer and I dropped rear anchors and off I went and joined the guys at, at uh, the Indep. And there were two or three of us that um, Ricky Su and uh, Len Wheeler, we we all wanted to go back and join our guys. And man, we ended up in the Hondi Valley and the most beautiful, beautiful part of Rhodesia that you've ever seen, besides Matopas, um, being a Matibili, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, so yeah, so we end, we did our year's service there at, at Inyanga. And then after that, I was called up for Tuaro A Company. So then I joined Tuaro A Company and uh, fell under uh, Major John Bissett. And his 2RC was Cedric Tippingwood, who later became the OC of Grey Scouts B Squadron. Okay. And uh, we and they uh, signal our sticks man wedding. And they would sit in the ops room and uh, yeah, until early hours of the morning, trying to study um, uh, the motor operandi of the tours in that area, and then we'd just do HD ops. So if we found out where they're hitting farms, where they where they're hitting stores, where they're converting the people, then he knew where to place us, and we had great success there. But um, he, whenever we wanted, whenever there was a contact, um, he wanted a tracking uh, trackers to come in and to get hold of the Sulu scouts was difficult to get them chop it in quickly and take a track. So he said he wanted his own tracking unit. So he, he chose myself and um, Henny Davis, Paul Roper and um, Gary Clutie, who was our stick leader, to go on a course with the Sulu Scouts at Wafa. So we were met there by um, Pete Clements and Sergeant Sengai and Sergeant Morris, who put us through the paces of tracking and um, doing the actual survival course there. Um, what a brilliant course, that, John. I don't know if you went on it. No. Um, it was brilliant. The, the bushcraft and learning how to uh, do traps. And I'm sure all the guys that are listening here, they, that have been on it, they can experience yeah. it. Yeah. And um, and and uh, that Pete Clements is, is, was a Makonia in my eyes. He, yeah. he was leader of, of the tracking wing. And um, <laughs> he said to us... Uh, there by the Bobab tree, he says, is the kitchen, and you guys are on a survival course, and he says, I've got bread, I've got everything there by the tree, and he says, you guys are welcome to help yourself, but if you get caught, <laughs> we're going to RTU you. So I thought, oh, lovely. So anyway, the first night, guess what? There goes the RLI guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I just can't remember the guy's name. Um, he was in charge of our tango, which is what they called the stick then, and um, it'll come to mind. And he scaled a piece of bread and we came and we split in four. We chewed on it like like uh, bubble gum there. <laughs> but yeah, that survival course was hectic. And they taught us whip traps and um, eating scorpions and all that and how to drink um, the water after through the through the bladder. And you know, it, it was it was, a, it was a good course. I really enjoyed it. And and the tracking side, we did uh, ground tracking and aerial tracking. And um, and just bushcraft, what we could get from the trees, the bushes, it, really fantastic. And then after that, uh, um, we came back to Tuaro and uh, Major Bissett worked in the Matopas. Um, he, he was something, some chemical guy there. And he knew of this old man, this old black guy called Meisler that um, was in the Matopas working for the Game Scouts. And he took us on for further training and uh, there we did more aerial uh, tracking and distinguishing between uh, human and animal tracking um, through 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 the grass, and also anti tracking. So we we got a good grounding on tracking, and we came back uh, to Tuaro, and uh, we were known as Sparrow Five Four. That was our call sign, and um, so whenever there was a contact with the other guys or we found tracks, we would be chopped in and take up the tracks. And uh, we we ended up becoming the trackers for both for all the companies in Tuaro, uh, A, B, C, D, and I think it was the E, until they got their own trackers in um, and did the same as what Major Bissa did. But we ended up doing five four Saturday Tenga, and um, yeah, we had a lot of punch ups, a lot of follow ups, and yeah, it was it was I enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> 
We had a sad time once we were out uh, uh, trekking and we got a call up to make our way to to an airfield and uh, there was going to be a chopper there to pick us up. And they picked it up, picked us up, and there was a convoy that was revved near Ngundu Halt. And anyway, we landed there, and there was a fam. The con, the whole convoy was revved, but there was a particular family. I think their name was Duplessis. And the old man and old lady, they got, um, I think, hit in the shoulder and in the leg or somewhere. But their little girl in the back was shot in the head. And uh, and when I when I saw this little blonde girl lying there dead, it it just made us so mad. We wanted to catch these shots. And uh, we we tracked them, and we tracked them for a long way. And they, they knew we were on them, and they were anti-tracking. And then they must have thought we'd given up because they carried on uh, walking without anti-tracking. And we followed them right up to the border and uh, near poultry store. I uh, don't know if you've ever been up there. And uh, near the cut line going into Mozambique. Yeah. And for somehow um, we were stopped. We, we weren't allowed to cross over, which we were upset about because... You know, when they're in Rhodesia, they're watching their backs and that. But when they get back into Mozambique, then they slack. And that's when we could have could have nailed them. But um, so be it. That's what happened. Um, terrible, terrible time, that. Yeah, John, then um, another contact we had, um, we we were put on a spore on, um, uh, there was quite a few, quite a few CTs. And we started following them. And we followed them. We were actually leapfrogging with the scouts. So we would track and we'd see they're going northeast. And then they'd drop a, a scout um, tracking guys uh, a couple of k's in front of us. And that cross cross grain in the direction that they were traveling, pick up spawn, and then they'd leap us, leapfrog us uh, closer. And it, it was about, hey, about six in the evening. And it was the last drop off. And we were still on tracks. And we came upon this rise where there was a lot of um, kayas there. And um, uh, I was busy checking at the time. And Henny Davis, my flanker, uh, said um, he saw he just saw run over the over the over the top of the crest of the copy by the kayas there. And anyway, we went there and we we looked, and sure enough, there we saw the they used to wear those Frelimo boots uh, that had HD pattern on the back with a chevron pattern. And we knew they were definitely, so we started following them and then it was started getting um, uh, late at night. So um, what we did then is Gary, our uh, stick leader, said, um, okay, guys, just look to your left. This is where we're going to ambush tonight and just have a look around you. And then we're going to carry on and go and have some food and then we'll come back when it's dark. So that's what we did. And we came back, we, we laid our ambush. And uh, as we were bedding in, um, two of us would bed, bed in and, the, and two would uh, on the outside would, would listen out. And again, Henny Davis heard this uh, noise and he said, you know, quiet, quiet. And we all stopped and we listened, listened, but we couldn't hear anything. So Gary gave the thumbs up. Okay, carry on putting your pod checks down. Yes, yeah, so so anyway, we're bedding down and Gary Gary said, uh, okay, guys, thumbs up, stop putting your, your sacks down again. And um, while we were doing it, he opened up and he carried a 28 arm. And it, he fired this thing and it hit the tree or uh, at uh, until in front of us, but right in front of us. Yes, and I was shouting. We were all shouting in sand and the bright light. Um, you couldn't see anything, even though it was very dark that night. And we opened up and uh, anyway, they they ran through. And we can't, we don't know how many there were. And uh, usually we were trained at the will and, and, and I'm sure in RLI that once you've engaged in a contact, you must move in case they to you. But we chose to stay there. And we lay there listening, listening, and we heard this. It was in a Mapani area, and we could hear the footprints coming on this dry riverbed behind us. They were coming up behind us, and we were all aware we could hear them. And the next moment, they opened up. But fortunately, their rounds were sky high. And um, and then Gary uh, threw a HE grenade into the river, and as it went off, we all took off and got into another ambush position. And they started sweeping the area, calling us. And I don't know if they were on drugs because it's the bravest bunch I've ever seen. And uh, and unfortunately, Gary had lost, uh, left his radio behind. And uh, so we were open and all our call signs could hear the contacts around. And we're trying to radio through, but they couldn't get signal with us. And uh, anyway, we went down into an ambush and yeah, they come again and extended line and we just opened up. And we had these fleeting contacts for such a long time. I think the last time, the last contact we had was like one in the morning. And um, and I remember um, we were um, we were 
the four of us were in a line trying to listen to where the noise was. And I heard this footprints coming um, near us. And I, I patted Henny next to me and I, I gave him the signal, um, the CTs coming. And we listened and yeah, came one right in front of us with a big cloak on, but his AK was pointing down, but it was still pretty dark. That's when we both opened up on him and he just disappeared. And I thought, was that a spook or what? Because where did he go to? And um, and he pulled a round off and a, and a tracer came in between Paul and myself, but it hit the ground in front of us and we saw the, the green flash burn out. And um, anyway, we, we um, that was the last contact that we had. But uh, they were calling us, come, come, you know, and where are you? And, and giving all sorts of things. One was screaming, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, and you know. But uh, we just kept it quiet. Weird, weird contact. And um, anyway, um, in the morning we woke up and I said to him, I can't believe we missed that guy. And anyway, we got up and we walked. And yeah, um, behind the Maponi bushes, there he lay with a run through the side of his head. So we got one. That was a, a bonus. Now we had to go back to to pick up the radio and notify um, our OC that uh, all's well and this is what happened. And um, anyway, we, we we started doing that buddy buddy run and we lay there for hours just watching the radio in our ambush position in case they were hiding, uh, waiting for us to get there. But eventually we got there and radioed through. So that was one one hectic uh, contact that we had with two or um, wouldn't want that one again. Another time we were um, we were based at Malapati and uh, the whole the whole company was in, and um, we were lying there. And we it, it was like in an old we were in an old building and there was a pit there um, where you could fix vehicles, drive over it, and that's that's where we were based. If the guys know, it was right near the river there. And um, yes, at twelve o'clock, these these came into the the camp and started mortaring us, but with big stuff and uh, giving us a good rev there. And uh, I'll never forget, I was in the kaya and I woke up <laughs> and on the on the windowsill, we had a radio playing music and it was the Rocky Horror Picture Show that just to jump to the left. I'm, whenever I heard it, I laughed because of what happened there. And it was blaring away and yeah, we shooting through the window and, and we had to get into our shell scapes because of, um, because of the mortars. And uh, anyway, we jumped in there and we gave it hell and uh, just shooting at, uh, at 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 flash hiders and but uh, nothing there again. Next morning we took tracks and uh, we followed them, but couldn't catch him. Uh, so that was one good stonking that we got one night. <laughs> it reminds me um, of, of that movie Apocalypse Now. There were similar s- sort of unreal scenes of contacts while there's while there's uh, sort of Jimi Hendrix or. Yes. You know, <laughs> rock, rock, rock music, you know, the doors or whatever playing in the back in the background. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah, it's funny how you get these unreal scenes. One night, uh, all the guys in in Tuaro, we was also in Mabal and um, in Mabaluta, and uh, they were off to go and um, drop off some guys. And to, to deploy them, and Major Bissett always used to say he doesn't want to send the guys after three o'clock because they've got to come back. And that's usually when they get ambushed because night time falls and you can't do follow-ups. So three o'clock was the deadline, but this time he had deployed at four o'clock <clears throat> just before getting dark. <clears throat> and um, the guys hit a landmine and Graham Fraser, one guy in the truck, he didn't have his belt on and was thrown in there and came down on his back <clears throat> on the top. So he was hurt and we couldn't get a, a Kazakh back into him. So, um, and we only had one vehicle in, in, in left. It was a 2.5. Uh, sorry, no, it was a 4.5, yeah. So, anyway, we uh, got deployed, and I, he chose a couple of us. One was um, Sergeant Major John Dutton, which a lot of guys will remember, and sadly that he's passed away now, but tough bugger. And, um, and myself, Henny Davis again, and we had a, a black soldier that came with us. And we were moving, and Derek, Derek Will was our driver. And Derek Will, believe it or not, has hit five landmines <laughs> in his in his time. And he was footing it. And John Dutton looked at me and said, Hey Bush, if we hit uh, Chimbambira now, we're in big cup because we're moving. And his words weren't cold and bang, we hit it was a front wheel debt. And it lifted we had an old RL, it wasn't a four five. Yes, and the sandbags, I just saw the sand stinging your face and uh, glare. And, and it's funny how the training comes back to you. You 
you don't just jump over, you jump where the tracks where you've just come and you run up and then go into the bush. And, you know, I think back now how that training was good. And uh, we're, so anyway, we had to sleep out there. We couldn't catch a vacuum. And um, next morning they sent in the choppers. But the funny thing is um, we had a couple of drivers and every time someone had to be deployed and Derek Will, or Mo we called him Model A, had to drive. No one wanted to go on his truck because he'd hit so many team bomb beaters. And there was another guy called Graham, Graham Heppel. He was squint. And everyone wanted to go with him because they said he was the best driver in the Rhodesian Army because he had one eye cutting the bush and the other one taking them, them guagua there for any landmines. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, yeah, that was my time with Tuaro, and um, and then uh, we we ended up in Fort Vic, and we had to do a um, an op there, a big HD op, because there was a lot of um, kandangas coming into uh, into that area, and they were hitting all the ranches. So we had to go and uh, try and find these guys, and they were really thought themselves great, and you know, real real rubbish. But anyway, we. We got to Makosi River Ranch and it was raining like anything. And it was like, it was just mud. The oaks were getting bogged down. and But we got there. And that night it came down heavy with rain. We didn't have time to uh, to dig ourselves in, shell scrapes and that. So the old farmer there, I forget his name, at Makosi River Ranch, he put us in his barn. And it was, and anyway, we lay there that night. And here comes the Kandangas that same night, 12 o'clock again. And they mortared and rocketed the, the farm. And the one mortar came down into the um into the barn, I believe it or not, came through the roof and fell and fell and went exploded in, in amongst all the farm implements. And not one person was hit, not even a scratch. So that was lucky and they took off. Then we knew that these guys were arrogant. And uh, so anyway, next day we took up small, but we didn't get far because of the, the rain, obliterated everything. And um so we, we carried on and we looking for them, looking for them. And then next minute, the Grey Scouts came. They sent in, I think, two sticks that uh, could track faster than what we could on horseback and cover a bigger area. So the uh, Grey Scouts came through and I uh, forget who the leader was at that time. And um, they were patrolling and we got we got notification to go and link up with the one stick at a weir. Um, Brian Stevenson was our was, was our stick leader there, and uh, so anyway, we made our way to the weir, and we got there. And as we got there, there was a hang of a punch up um, at, uh, just in front of us. Must have been about three four hundred meters away from us. So we knew that um, these Grey Scouts had engaged in a contact. So um, and we couldn't go through in case they they thought it was us, you know, and just start shooting. So we we laid an ambush and we covered the weir. So we thought with the river pumping, they'll they'll run over the wheel and we can have a turkey shoot as they cross over. But uh, nothing happened. And uh, anyway, after the contact, we swept through and met up with these guys. And they, they had one guy called um, Charlie Johnson who was shot in the stomach. He, they ambushed them as they came over this copy. And Charlie's foot was too far in the stirrup. So when his horse threw him, it, it dragged him over the rocks for a few meters. Yeah, and his foot came out. And anyway, we got there and he was in a lot of pain. And uh, someone had an ampule of morphine, which we gave him. Uh, and he settled down straight away. See, that worked so quickly. And he kept saying, where's the choppers? Where's the choppers? And we said, it's coming. We cut an LZ and this chopper landed and we loaded Tolly on. And um, yeah, and, and anyway, he uh, took off in the air and we carried on with sport um, to try and catch him. And it must have been about... 20 minutes to half an hour in the end, they came back and said, sorry, your mate's gone. Yes, that was, that was sad that. And it's, it's funny, I had a guy um, come up on Facebook saying, does anyone know what happened to Charlie Johnson? He was my best man um, at my wedding and I was overseas and I came back and I heard he had passed away, but I've got no information on, on his death and that. So I've explained as much as what I could to him and he was very thankful. Yeah, so that was, and you know that that operating with the Grey Scouts, they were so polished. I could I could remember they were like these were soldiers, you know. And uh, I always used to say some mothers have them, and the army uh, gets them. But <laughs> um, specialising in, in a good unit, um, 
like you know with Ola Line, um, you you do get a polished uh, um, training. Not to say that the other guys weren't. Even I respect all all, all the guys, um, <clears throat> even Godforce and all of them. Everyone did their bit, so we can't say we were better than the other. Mm. Um, you know, the, I, I really respect every single guy that fought in the Rhodesian Army. They all did their bit, and we loved our country, and we we did our best to protect it. Yeah. yeah so. Uh, John, after after our call up after, after Makosi River Ranch, I really wanted to join the Grey Scouts, and uh, I looked into it, and I found that quite a few of the guys in our in our um, company also wanted to do. And one was Captain Tippingwood, who was our TRC. He wanted to join. There was Fudge Brown, um, Torch Hancock, uh, Isaac van der Marwa, Isaac, uh, Donny Peebles, uh, Ian Bachelor. They were quite a few guys that uh, wanted to join at the same time. So we all went on selection. And yeah, we became uh, Grace Scouts, got our colours, and really, I was really proud. And anyway, I thought, now, where do these guys patrol? Where do they send them? And our first patrol is back into the southeast <laughs> at Malapati. So I lived in that Malapati. Even if I had to go there today, I, I know it backwards. And I got stuck in Sergeant Chris Estazen's uh, section. And uh, he said, right, we're going to uh, Crook's Corner, going to the weir there by the Malabangui ri uh, River. And so he's looking at what, his map what, and year, said, what year was this, roughly? What era were we in talking In the Greys. It was beginning, uh, it was 76 sometime with the Greys. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, somewhere there. Yeah, so we, um, yeah, so we ended up uh, patrolling around that area. And good bunch of guys, really, really a good bunch. And uh, we'd come back and we were looking after a keep once. <laughs> and uh, we must have got about three, four Ks from the keep. And uh, Fudge Brown shouted, uh, last one back to camp makes coffee. Yes. And yeah, we took off through the bush, but thick bush. <laughs> you know, so sleeping bags being left behind and all sorts. But uh, it, we had we had good fun in the Grey Scouts. It was a good bunch of guys. Yeah, and... and uh, uh, Sorry, breaking again. Yes, I'm giving you work, John. Sorry, my <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> yeah, when you get old, your your memory goes, eh? Um, I was just thinking that, you know, the Bushni who started off as a farrier for, you know, <laughs> for Rhodes yeah. and, and the British South Africa company, now, now Bushney's back uh, years later with horses again, eh? With horses again, can you believe it? And farming again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the wheel doesn't go far, eh? <laughs> my, my biggest and worst um, contact, I was with the Grey Scouts and we were in the Chicken Bedsy area. And uh, we were making our way back to, to camp and there was, I think there were eight of us. Yeah, eight of us, a stick. And... Um, and as we crossed over the road, we just saw all the spore. And uh, we thought, geez, look at all the, the, the spore. And the way we determined how many, how many we're following, we used to grab the last boot on the left and the last boot on the right, make a line, and then measure one meter uh, in front and draw another line. And then you count all the footprints in between. And that told us how many we were following, or more or less. And we saw we were following about 30 um, Kandangas. And... Uh, so anyway, it, it was they didn't even know we were there. They were just walking, and the one was one had a stick behind him and was pulling it behind him, trying to rub out sport. But it actually made it even easier for us to follow. And we took off at a canter, and we were moving. We must have been catching them up so quickly. And uh, anyway, we came to this thick bush, and we we went in single file for quite a while. And then um, we had a guy from Sayak. I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want to embarrass him, but he was a ring piece, and. Uh, he, um, because he was a lieutenant, he was in charge of our section. And he said, right, we're going to stop for a smoke break and tea break. And uh, so we all got off our horses. And um, and we could hear a noise in the distance. So he said uh, to Fudge Brown, myself, and myself, go and check out what that noise is. So the two of us went off on foot. <clears throat> and we must have gone a couple of kilometers, um, trying to work our way around. But we... Um, and we, we came, across, came close to a river and we saw these females coming out with pots on their heads and stuff. But they spotted us and they didn't scream or run or anything. So we thought nothing of it. And they carried on and we carried on. 
And as we approached, we heard this noise getting louder and louder. So we crept up, but we couldn't see what was in front of us. And uh, it was really thick, thick bush, you know, around a river. And there was a little rabbit hole there, and Fudge crawled inside there. And he was in there about a minute or so, and he crawled back, and his face was as white as anything, and his bottom lip was quivering, and he's going like this to me. So I crawled in there, and I had a look, and it was just makalangas all over the top. It was the river in front of us, and then um, I'm, I'm talking about 50 to 75 meters away. So it was the river, and then this bank going up, and they were all on top of the bank. And on top of the bank, there were three um, gods, and they had their shirts off. One had a bandolier, and it was the SKS bandolier, and the other one, AK, and they hadn't a clue that we were down there. They were looking right over our heads. And some were reading, you could see they were reading these Chimurenga magazines. Some were cleaning their rifles. Some were the, the um, females were washing their clothes and they were chatting them up. And, and it, was, it was a perfect place for, um, uh, for to hit them. And anyway, we, we crept back and uh, snivelled out of them. We got, um, we started calling this, this um, captain or lieutenant, a lieutenant John. And we said to him, uh, We've just spotted a, a whack of goods. They have no idea that we're here, and we need to send fire force as quickly as possible um, while, they, while they're still in this position. But it looked like they were going to be there for a while. So he said, negative, uh, meet me at such and such a lockstep. And we and he asked us where these uh, where these uh, Makandangas were. So we gave the, the lockstep and clear where they are because we knew um, that, uh, that we were going to hit them. And... Um, we pulled back and he met up with us and he says, right, I want uh, uh, myself, Bushney Brown and um, I think it was, and Torch Hancock yeah, uh, to come with me. We're going to go and investigate. And I said to him, sir, how can you go and investigate? We're lucky they never saw us, just two of us. And now you want us all to go with you. He says, don't argue, just follow me. Yes, and here we go back again. And we can get it in museum. <laughs> And we don't want to. We don't want them to see us because this is a good surprise uh, contact. This anyway, we came to this little rabbit hole and we told him to look in there. So he crawled inside there, and he was in there for about five ten minutes, just checking out the you know surveying what's happening. So I thought he was going to come back and say, right, we're going to set up an ambush. Hunters can give a good striker. Oh yes, and prior to that, they linked up with another uh, uh, thirty Makandangas. So they all mixed there and. Uh, so anyway, he crawled into this rabbit hole and he was there for a good 10 minutes having a look around there. And uh, I thought he was going to come back and say, let's send in a, a strike and and uh, we'll hit anything that runs out of it, which nothing happened. And the next minute he lifted, lifted his rifle and I thought, what's this guy doing? And bah, he pulled around and shot one of the, the gods on the, on the top there. Jeez, the next minute they opened up and we had one hell of a contact. We had no cover and I thought, what an idiot. And anyway, we're firing away there. And uh, next minute, I had a stoppage. And I thought, fuck, what a time to have a stoppage. And I couldn't get the, the, the rat to come back. <clears throat> and it was damn fuss. Jeez, and I was kicking it with my foot, trying to force it back because it was just stuck. I couldn't even pull it. And I thought, what a, and, and it was like heavy horn door. It was like a good contact. And um, eventually, I got the working parts to go forward. And I managed to get off for a round and shot off into the bush. And I thought, well, that's it. And I tried to pull again, nothing. And then I, I took my gas off. And as my piston came up, it was snapped clean and off. And I don't know why. Maybe the armors can tell me what happened there. But um, it snapped and off. And I always used to carry my rifle with uh, the gas on zero. Because if I had a stoppage, I knew it wasn't gas. It was, as I'd run out of run. So, so, and I don't know if that had uh, anything to do with it. But anyway, I had a sidearm, which the Grey Scouts all carried. So I'm... Got this stupid blooming uh, nine millimeter star with me, and uh, and torch uh, shouted charge towards them because uh, we were going to get taken out. So we ran in, but thank goodness there was a dry riverbed, just a narrow one. We jumped over, and uh, a lot of them started uh, taking off because they didn't know how many of us there were. And um, all of a sudden, here comes uh, the bluebirds. Yes, was our chuffed. And I thought, where did these acts come from? Meanwhile, when we radioed through the message to this lieutenant, and there was a relay station that picked up our call and sent it to Jock Pretenga that we had spotted so many Makandangas here. So they sent um, sent the fire force, and they couldn't have come at a better time. And uh, they dropped RLI stop groups all over the place. 
And I uh, remember he called us down and said, uh, what is your call sign down there? And we told him we were five, five Bravo. And he said, there's two with their hands in the air, going to apprehend them. And Fudge and I walked through and yeah, they were with their hands in the air. So we grabbed them, pulled them down and I grabbed his AK. I thought, at least I've got an automatic weapon now. And uh, so we held them there and the contact continued and, and until the end. And we only had 13 kills and the two captures where if we had done it properly, we could have had a hell of a lot uh, higher um, uh, success rate there. And us guys we were so cheesed off with this block. And anyway, um, he got in the chopper and he flew back to go and debrief. And uh, we had to pull his horse back. And and we tied the, the Makandangas with rope and told them to the head collars of our horse and told them if they run, they'll be the first ones to get it. And then we made our way. Now, these guys must have been mingling all around the bush there. So, um, Anyway, we made our way back to camp and we saw when we got back, we notified our country member for Captain Mike Wilson uh, at the time or whether it was Captain Tippingwood. And we told them what had happened. And he said, is this true what you're telling me? And we said, yes, that's exactly what happened. And apparently this guy went on court martial, so I don't know whatever happened to him. But uh, that, that was a movie. You know, to, to be in a contact, your your eyes are open and... Uh, but you have no weapon. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's that's another story, boy. <laughs> yeah, so that was the the one time with the grace. With the grace. Um, I also uh, I also used to turn my gas on my MAG to zero. To zero. Because I found it yeah. gave me a, a higher cyclic rate of fire. You know. On yeah. The yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so instead of going boom, 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 it would go room, room. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I used to laugh. We had a good MAG gunner in the grace. He used to carry the MAG on the horse. And sure. his name was Steve Hancock. We called him Torch. And he was a wary bugger. And he was such a funny bloke because whenever we hit a contact or we were ambushed, and uh, it took him a while to get going and getting his belts already. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the contact, you just heard him. He started swearing in in, um, in Mandavere <laughs> on the top of his voice. And then you hear that Queen of the Valley just start opening up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a real character. Um, yeah, so then um, the, the one day we, we went to Wedza and we had just arrived and we were meeting up with a squadron. So there must have been about 100, 100 Grey Scouts as we all came together. And we no sooner got there and there was a big punch up down the road with quite a few tours. And uh, Captain Wilson, I think it was, said, just get out there, get out there and you can sort yourselves out. But just get out and, and cover the front so we can um, we can ambush them as, they, as they're sweeping through. Yes, and we took off, and uh, we went across this mini field. And you imagine a hundred horses at full gallop, and uh, we had our Bruno Robbie. He was one of our, our guys. His brother was Andre Robbie, the founder of Sulu Scouts, and he was with us. But he was he was uh, in the camp, and he says he has never seen such a beautiful sight as a hundred horses galloping over this field, yeah. and it was just dust yeah. until you couldn't hear the hooves anymore, and the dust just took its time coming down. He said it was just brilliant. And anyway, we got into uh, into uh, stock groups, and it was uh, being in, in, on horseback. It's different to being on on foot. You know, when you patrol an extended line on foot, you usually about three to five meters apart as you're sweeping. Where um, with with the horses, you're usually about fifty to seventy five meters apart. And I was on the end flank, and we were hugging this copy, and it was a very rocky outcrop. And I never rode with my hands, with my reins in my hand. My horse's, my horse's name was Foxy, um, uh, number 640. And if I wanted to go right, I used to bang him with my right knee or left with my left knee. And if I wanted him to stop, I'd just push down on the stirrup and oh, Foxy. And I'd be holding my rifle like this. And I was coming around the uh, around this copy as we were sweeping around. And I'm looking and I thought, yeah, this is a good ambush position, this. But I'm looking, looking, and the next minute I hollered a cocky Franklin took off in front of me. Yes. You know the noise they make when they take off. And Foxy reared and dumped me. Now there's a rule in Grey Scouts. If you fall off your horse, you've got to buy the stick a round of drinks. So I yell up, let me fall on my backside in the dust there. Rifle over there. And I'm crawling to get it up. And I look up and uh, all the guys are looking at me going... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna buy them around when I get back, and everything was silent, you know. But uh, yeah, we had some good fun. Um, good, good fun. Uh, we we um, we were in the bush, and we came back, and we had to do retraining. And we were told we're getting a new RSM, 
and he came from RLI, and his name was Jimmy Jamison. I don't know if you knew him, John. Yeah. And this, this oak, he was a big block, and it looked like he had a piece of putty stuck on his nose, <laughs> and his wrists were the size of my ankles. <laughs> yeah, a strong man, and he took no cuck, and he took us for point of aim. And he's giving the lecture, then we just met him, and everyone's nervous now about this, and you could check he was very strict. And while he's, in his, while he's busy training us, he makes eye contact with me. And I think, and I look at him. And he looks at me again. He goes, Bush, is that you? And I said, yes, sir. Shit, it's good to see you again. How are you, my foot? How are you keeping? And he comes and shakes my hand. And straight away, I thought, oh, he's thinking I'm, a, I'm Alistair, my twin brother. And I found out he was the RSM at Inyanga. So he knew my brother very well. <laughs> and he says, man, it's good to see you again. And he says, are you still a good uh, shotter? Because Alistair went on a sniper's course. And then I knew straight away. And I said, sir, um, you, you're getting me mixed up with my twin brother. Yes. And he flipped me. Eh? He went red in the face and said, sit down, you bloody thing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I said, I thought, no, no, he's going he's gonna to rip me. I can't make him feel like a real ass. And, uh, but he was a nice chap. And uh, yeah, he, he used to take us on, on, um, on parade there. And uh, you know what RSM parade grounds like. And he would say, um, right, guys, I want you to learn the, the Great Scout song. And if any of you don't know the Great Scout song, you're going to be charged. And he often used to have us on open uh, in open there and with our horses, and he'd come and inspect us. And then he would say, um, uh, do you want my punishment or do you want the major's punishment if you did something wrong? And if you said the major's punishment, um, then you were a hoss in his eyes. And he, he'd want to RT you and he'd tell you, you useless thing. Now you used to say, no, I'll take yours, sir. And you used to brace with an open order and he'd punch you in the chest, but you'd fly right to the back ranks. And that was him. That was old Jimmy Jamison. And the great scouts can all that are listening can really fire this uh, real mad bugger. So anyway, we, he's got us all on Monday morning parade there. And uh, yes, there were a lot of us. I think A, uh, a and B squadron were together. So he stands in and he says, right, have you guys learned the great scout song? So uh, we all said, yes, yeah, sir. So he says, right, one of you are going to come here and lead it. Right, push me, come here. And I thought, yes, of 150 guys, he chooses me. So anyway, I go up there, march up there, come. So he says, start. So I start singing, far, far away, there's a bugle blowing. Saddle your horses for war. Farewell, my love, I must be going. Our grandfather's done it before. And then it goes into the into the chorus, and it goes, two, three, four. Now the great scouts ride again. <laughs> Out the history they came. And the new ones are the same. Mounted men of fighting fame. But I was halfway through the chorus to try and get the guys to go with the chorus with me. Yeah. And he starts mooding me with a bloody pay stick and said, don't you dance on my brain square, boy! <laughs> 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 yeah, you're a real character. But um, that was old Jimmy Jamison. I think I've asked you before, but um, uh, you you went with Clive Midland, eh? He was a squad in Midi, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you and said Stitch, that, yeah. Stitch, Atkinson, and yeah, there was, there was quite a few. Um, um, I was with Billy Fulhoun, yeah, Bruno Robbie. Uh, yeah, they, they were all a squad and we were B squad. And, and I don't know why we never really came together. They used us in different areas um, that I, I can't understand. But uh, yeah. No, it's, it was like that in RLI. If you were... Three commander, you never, you never met the guys from two commander or one commander. You never saw, yeah. you know. Maybe yes, once, yes. I think once in the whole of RLI's history, the all, all three commanders and, and support commander came together to troop the color or something. But it was very unusual, you know. You, yeah, you just never. It's like being in a different school almost, you know. Yes, um, yes. You know, it's not like you. It's not like you're at the same school. Talking of which, when I was at Plumtree, we used to play rugby against Hamilton. Yes, I remember playing there. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. It, with all the cuck, cuck on the lawn there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, you were know, a Plumtree you, boy, eh? Yeah, I was a Plumtree, our oh, grey house, yeah. With old, uh, yeah. With old uh, Pinky Rosenfels. You know the Rosenfels? Yes, yes, another Rosenfels. And the Yorks. Woody yeah. and Barry. Woody, yeah. yeah. We no, the was, you, you brought back so many memories. I was thinking of Don Price. Don was, yes. was like started that tracking school at Waffa Waffa originally. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh um, no, he was a he legend. Was also a plum tree boy. Um Okay. But um 
Anyway, you carry on. Carry on with your story. I interrupted you there. Oh, lovely to hear your side yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I knew all those plum tree boys. We, we, um, I used to go with my dad hunting there um, before the war. You know, we used to go to Marula, fig tree, plum tree, yeah. and we met all the Hronovolts, uh, the, the um, Rosenfelts and uh, Yorks and yeah. Fraser, uh, yeah, Cliffs. Yes. yes. Yeah, lovely, lovely time. Yeah. We uh, out in patrol uh, in the um, in in the corner reserve. And a lot of lions used to smell the horses and, and come. And apparently, um, the one one time, I wasn't my stick, but this, this lion came through and jumped on one of the horses and it double kicked it. And the guy started shooting and the, the lion took off. But that horse, I forget its name, was never used again because it was too skittish. And they used, used him or her for breeding. But uh, the one time, whenever we used to lay an ambush, we used to um, lay our, our fart sacks down and we tie our horses a good about 50, 30, 50 meters away. And we tie them with a short rope because um, uh, if you left them with a long rope, they'd start grazing and the one foot would go over the rope and the next one they get into a tangle and they get rope burns. So then you had to jump up and go and uh, help him. And uh, yeah, that, so we always tied with a short short rein. And then the one night um, <laughs> we were lying there in, in uh, trying to get some Z's and uh, this guy, I think his name was Corporal Prince, he left his horse with a long lead and this blooming horse got his leg entangled there and I was pulling the tree and making such a noise. So, you know, I just woke him up and he got up and he was all done mooding. And anyway, he walked up. And one thing you never do at night time is walk up behind a horse. You know, don't just walk. He's going to give you a swap. And he was still Gemakar from waking up. And as he walked there, this horse gave him a double tap. Doof! And he flew across the bush into one of the other horses. And he gave him a boot back again. <laughs> I was like watching a game of table tennis. <laughs> and he came back and he says, the bastard, he says he can lie there and die. And he's not going back there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, in, the, in, the, in the game reserve, it was different with horses. Uh, the wild animals did smell them. And, but uh, you know, you, you can't believe the ground that you track. We, we had an RLI major that came and joined us. And the RLI was sweeping the one end and Grey Scouts was the other end. And they were sitting with our major, um, I think it was McKenna. And uh, he couldn't believe the ground that the Grey Scouts covered when they were looking at the grid references because we'd give our, our lock stats every hour. And you could see the foot sloggers would move so much and you know the Grey Scouts covered such a vast area. So for um, patrolling along the border fences and that and, and trying to pick up tracks, we were, we were good uh, for that type of work. Um, you know, catching them up quickly because they couldn't outrun a horse, that's for sure. But um, we, we also had to watch out for ticks um, in, in the Mateki Hills. There was a lot of red ticks and the oaks got tick fever. And we even started uh, bathing and dip, dip, uh, cattle dip. And it only lasted, oh, it must probably three days and we had to come back in again because oaks were getting tick fever and the horses were getting it. And, and we had to fly in a vet in the bush. And sometimes the horses got colic in the, in the middle of the bush. And when a horse gets colic, his whole intestine twists and he jumps up in the air, he's in so much pain and bangs down and jumps up and boy, a makandangal here, that horse from miles away. So we had to try and calm him down and get him and let his stomach unwind. So we had some fun in the bush as well with that sort of thing with the horses. But um, they were clever. You know, one thing I'll say about a horse, when I patrolled, I used to watch my horse. Uh, I, he had a much sharper eyesight and feeling than what you did as a, as a soldier. And uh, you, as soon as those ears just come up and he starts looking, you can look and you can sure as nuts, there's someone walking past. And so they were really, really good. Uh, once we were on a, on a um, airstrip at Nkoma Barracks and they wanted to prove to it. And they hid a couple of guys in the middle in the bush there. And they said, I'd do a circle and you must tell me when you feel that there's somebody in the bush near you. And we'd start patrolling, and um, next minute, all the horses started shying away. And we'd say, oh, there's someone here, and then they'd stand up. And so they were brilliant, really brilliant to, to watch. They, so it was nice to be with the horses as well, the <laughs> extra set of eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, we were in the Wedza area. This was 1979. And, um, and just uh, near the end of 79, I think, and Ian Smith and uh, Muzarewa got together and they formed Zimbabwe Rhodesia. So we were we were on patrol. They called us in and uh, they took two from each 
uh, stick and they said we must go and join these auxiliaries and and patrol with them and it's so jeepers so anyway um they dropped us off and this truck came and picked us up in the bush and it was full of um old kandangas is what i can say they all had ak's and rpds so uh peoples and i johnny peoples we jumped on this truck and uh, they greeted us they were friendly and off we went and we came into their base camp and as we came in, there was an anthill with an RPD gunner there, hidden behind the anthill. And I still looked and we, we, we came in and we, we got off. And he said, right, I'm going to show you your, um, your area where you can bunk down and give you your ox fire and just get um, have a shower and whatever. And then we want you to come to the ox tent and meet Comrade Lucky. So anyway, we went and did all this and uh, we came and we met this Comrade Lucky who, invited, who welcomed us into the camp and... And uh, so we were patrolling with them. And I still said to peeps, yeah, Johnny, <laughs> I hope Paul Smithy knows what he's doing because if this Zimbabwe Rhodesia doesn't work, we're in Kakia. <laughs> but it, it went well and we didn't have any hassles. But that was a, a weird time. Um, at the, yeah, I don't know if any of the other great scouts can remember that. And how many of us, I don't even to this day know how many were sent out to patrol with them. And it was so the locals could see that we had joined forces with a Shona organization and to try and get the votes. And that's what the, their thoughts were. I, I had no idea that Grey Scouts were so effective. And so, um, you know, I I also wanted to join the Grey Scouts at one Did point. You? I can remember, yeah. yeah sure. Thinking, you know, just thinking how cool it must be to work with the horses that. and stuff like that. Because when I was a teenager, I did a lot of um, horse riding and working okay. with Work, working with horses and cattle and and that type of thing and um, okay, we in country. No, uh, actually, um, my dad used to be the Anglican priest in Hartley, uh, in the Hartley area, and yeah. one of his best friends was uh, Brian Hudson, um, who was married to a, a beautiful Irish girl called Morag Hudson, who was one of my mom's dancing pupils, and um, yeah. Brian was on the farm next to the Falunes who were attacked, one of the first farms to be attacked by the terrorists right at the beginning of the order. Yeah, Yeah, was the Falun family that was killed. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, yeah. Um, And Brian had a a lot of horses. Um, And then when we moved out to Chipinga, um, there was, um, I don't know if it was the same Duplessy family that you're talking about, their daughter being killed, but his name was Butt Duplessy, the farmer. But he owned Clearwater Tea Estate out on, on, on the eastern border road, you know. And uh okay. Butt had a thing for horses, so much so that we built a we built a racetrack and he, he had this beautiful uh golden palomino. And I remember he ordered a a saddle that was delivered. It was one of those Western saddles with a oh yes, yes like yes, a chair back like a chair back yes. and, and a thing for the for the lasso and you know, yes. and we 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 had no oh. idea what what this back um you know it's got it's got the main sort of um uh, strap that goes under the front legs, but then there was also one that goes behind the stomach on the back legs. You know? we, <laughs> we, we we didn't realize that that was to make the thing buck, you know. So we, <laughs> it was a bucking strap, you know. So we put this thing on, and I climbed on the horse, and the horse started. It was like a rodeo, you know. The horse. So it was, how long can I stay on before this thing bucks me off, you know? <laughs> and we were so upset with this horse. And and then the horse also took off and my foot got stuck in the stirrups. Although the, the cowboy saddles have different kind of, those big wooden type stirrups, you know, but my foot also got yes, stuck. Yes, and I, got, I got dragged along, but it was a gravel road, so I, I didn't get badly. <laughs> yes. That's yeah, one I, thing I I'm never did. Horses, though. That's one thing I never did is put my foot right in a stirrup. I always just had it just on the <laughs> ball of my foot so it could fall out. Yeah. So we had McLennan saddles, um, which was also nice on that a nice pommel yeah. in the front. And when we when we actually joined the, the Grey Scouts, um they said this is a horse, this is a head, this is the horse, and he, he he went right through everything. So no matter if you were the best rider or never ridden a horse before, that the training was excellent. And you know, John. At the end of our course, we were dismounting at the gallop. And you think, yes, but did we buy plots? Yes, we fell off plenty. And But you get it into a full gallop and then take your, your foot over the pommel of the saddle 
and jump onto his neck. And all your weight would be in his neck and your feet would be bouncing on the ground until he slowed down and then you'd run off with your rifle in your left hand. So it was, but we, we did it in, you know, from trot to canter to, to, to uh, galloping. But uh, that was the training that we got. It was brilliant. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, the, we had remount riders when we went on R&R. &R. Um, our, horses, our horses were also on R&R &R and they were all allocated to us. So no one took yours. That was your horse. And it's uh, funny, after the camp, those horses were so fit and they go scroll. And then after you go for your 10 days R&R &R and you come back and they're as fat as anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you slowly go through and you... But but brilliant, you know. And you knew your horse. I, we used to jab them up the backside with grease and in the ears and all over, and never got kicked. Never, your horse knew you. you and and I can, you know, I think it was Billy Phil you know, one of the guys was saying, I can't remember who it was, saying when your horse got killed, how uh, it's like a family member being killed. Uh, see the oaks crying. You know, it's like a pet, like a faithful dog. Yeah, uh, it wasn't yeah. nice. And yeah. uh, a lot of horses were shot, but a lot of them didn't die. Got rounds. We had a contact once where we were ambushed, and um, and uh, the one horse took three three runs in the in the neck and didn't touch any vital organs, and they would run after contact. I'm sure a lot of people are going to ask the question: What did your horses do in a contact? And it's funny, um, you'd have the contact, and they'd run off, and they'd stop, and then they'd just start grazing. Sometimes they'd be right in the middle of the contact, you know. So they didn't know that because our rebound riders, when we were on R and R. They used to train them against gunfire. We'd ride them into a um, into the bush, and the guys would be hiding there with blanks. And as you approach it, they all da, 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 da. and then the remount rider used to hold those horses and get them used to gunfire and, and ride them into the gunfire. So their training was good. But when it came to reality, I think they could feel this feel through your backside in the saddle that this is serious. And a lot of times they did you, which to me was a good idea because. When you when you get ambushed and you're still thinking of getting getting off your horse and taking cover, he's ditched you already, and you're crawling around um, for cover. So, but and you could teach them to lie down, Les. No, I never got to that. I'm sure um, some of the guys did. I we I, I don't know of anyone, but no, we we never had that, John. Les, thank you so much for your interesting talk. Brother, thank you, John. I'm, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Awesome you to get hold of me. Yeah, yeah. And lovely, and lovely to finally meet you. I see you on all the yeah. on all the programs, and I just want to thank you and Hannes for all the work that you two do. Um, I think it's a, such a good platform for guys to remember back and jog your memories back, and yeah. and, and leave something for your kids. You know, they can say, "Oh, that was Opa," you know, yeah. as his story. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny. I, I, I don't know with the listeners. Yeah, my kids. <laughs> they never asked about the war, so you, 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 you know, the only time we can talk about it is when we get together. Uh, you know, the guys that were in the war, we can chat and and reminisce and have a good laugh. But uh, other than that, uh, there's nothing. Kids aren't interested. Yeah. Uh, but I always said these lighties of today, they need to uh, do at least first phase and get that discipline installed in them. And yes, because uh, I think when they get older, Les, they will want to know. Um, yeah. Uh, it's um, I think it's a book called Bird Song. Um, I can't remember the name of the author now, but the book's called Bird Song, one word, and it's about yeah. it's about a, a a a granddaughter who goes up one day. She's now getting uh in middle aged, and <clears throat> she goes up into the attic and opens a a, a metal trunk up in the attic, and wow. it's her it's her grandfather's um. World War One uniform, you know, yes, and, yes. and he had a diary about about you know being in the trenches in France, and uh, um, she decides to go to France and go to all the battlefields um, yeah. where her grandfather fought, and she goes to this. She's driving, looking for this one battlefield, and she sees this huge monument that's that's almost looks like a factory or something it's so big something almost something that was built by albert speer or something you know one of those yeah, yeah. massive uh stone concrete type of uh, monuments and um she goes there and um uh, there's a there's just these rows and rows and rows and rows of white uh crosses um and this be these beautiful gardens being tended uh, by a gardener and then, and then, 
there's this monument with these massive arches reaching right up into the almost into the sky, these huge arches. Yes. <clears throat> and every inch of these arches are covered with names. Yeah. Names upon names upon names upon names going up going up 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 meters and down and you know hundreds of meters of, of little of little names all crammed together, one on yeah. one on top of the other. And and uh, she's looking at all these names, and, and and then she, the gardener comes over and greets her, and um, she says, "Who who are all these people? Are, are these all the names of the people uh, that were killed in the war?" And he yeah. he looks at her and he says, "No, madam, uh, these are the lost." She says, "What do you mean the lost. the lost?" He said, "No, in in just in these fields here." These are the people they never found. <laughs> wow. Wow. And, and she, just, eh? she just sat down and she just wept and wept and wept when she realized. Shame. She said, I never knew. I never knew. And, you yeah. know, that's the thing. You know, our grandchildren just don't know. I mean, yeah. who, ca who, who cares about World War One now, you know? Uh, yeah, but, exactly. But, yeah. Somebody's got to remember, and somebody's. That's why we we take almost like a the solemn oath to never forget at the going down of the sun, and in the, we will we yes. will remember them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, 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 definitely, John. And and yeah. tell me, George tells me that you um, you were uh, into sword fighting and karate, and you you done well for yourself. Well, I, I did Japanese martial arts most of my life. Uh, my dad got his black belt in uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu before World War II, uh, I think in Jesus. 1938. Yeah. So when I was growing up, he started teaching me, and uh, and I, that's where I got an interest and uh, started to, to learn uh, uh, Japanese sword fighting in Los Angeles in 1983. But uh, that's another wow. story. Yes. Like, yeah, the luck to hear it one day. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank that. you, John. And All God right. bless you, my brother. <laughs> God bless you too, Les. Cheers thank you. Bye-bye, John. Bye. Bye-bye.